the title you see, God calls Jacob. We we watched God. Well, we watched Jacob last week. If you were here last week, uh, go through some. Uh, uh, let's just call it sinful, deceptive behavior, and and it led to a situation uh, that his brother wanted to kill him, and and so this. This story of God's redemption that is being written and it has been written now for us, we get to dive into and see more of today as God calls Jacob in this passage. So Genesis chapter 28, we are going through the book of Genesis here at Lakeside and um, I, I hope you've been as encouraged as I have going through this. You know, this book, the Bible, we say affectionately and consistently and intentionally and emphatically, this is God's word. Like God revealed himself to us in his word. And, and it's not just the New Testament that he's revealed himself to us. It is the Old Testament. It is the whole book. And so we go through books of the Bible and we encounter things sometimes that we don't like. And I'll tell you as a preacher, sometimes I come across things I don't want to have to talk about. And, and sometimes it's things that I simply don't have a full grasp on, and it's very difficult to stand in front of a number of people and, and say, thus saith the Lord. But yet it is His Word. So we come to Him seeking His Word, and we don't skip a, a verse because it's God's Word. So would you pray with me as we get started this morning? Father God in heaven, you are so, so good. Your character, your heart towards us, towards people, towards people throughout all generations has been uh, so much greater than we deserve. You have chosen to pour out your mercy on us, to display your grace in us, and also in comparison to justice, not in, not ever once leaving character or changing and being untrustworthy, but fully trustworthy and faithful through it all. It's amazing to to go through this book of Genesis and to see your hand at work, this book of beginnings and many firsts in this. And I pray, Lord, you would help us even today to further see your glory and your goodness, your plan of redemption unfolding in the history of humanity. Thank you, God, for your word. Pray that you would strengthen me even now as I, as I proclaim your word, Lord, to lean into you, to trust you, to speak by your spirit. And Lord, I pray that we would listen also, prepared to do, and may your spirit enlighten us, Lord, open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. The entirety of your word is truth. So we come to you this morning, we plead with you for, for that. I ask that every week, Lord, help us to know you. Help us to walk with you. And I ask that in the name of our Savior, Jesus, amen. Well, in Genesis 28, we, we pick up in the middle of something that's already gone on. Again, hopefully you were here last week. If, if not, you might uh, need to tune in and listen to it. But, but just to tell you where we are, that Jacob had just essentially cheated his brother out of this fatherly blessing. And And in those days, whatever this fatherly blessing was, it had a lot to do with a one-time blessing, like it it could only be given to one, and typically to the oldest son. And Jacob, being the twin of his brother Esau, uh, stepped in when he heard his dad tell Esau that he's about to give the blessing and to go prepare a meal. And of course, it wasn't acting alone. His mom, Rebecca, is actually the one that prompted that and even pressured Jacob to take action in that. And, and so he does, and he goes and fools his dad, Isaac, and convinces him that he's Esau. So Jacob, uh, Isaac gives this blessing to Jacob. And to console himself, his older brother, even though maybe by minutes, he, he decided that he was going to kill his brother. That's, he was pretty upset, pretty worked up. And Rebecca, you know, have you ever seen a mom that Though she may not be that forefront person, but she kind of makes sure all the things happen as she wants it to happen. I think Rebecca's that kind of mom. And, and so she goes, and she's like, Jacob, you need to go. You need to go to my brother Laban, and you've got to get out of here. And, but to do so, she also goes and kind of tells Isaac what he should do and, and paints it as his idea. And so Isaac, as he begins to speak in 28 verse 1, has just heard Rebecca, his wife, tell him, 
if Jacob marries one of these Canaanite women, uh, my life is just not even worth living. I mean, she's it's like pretty drastic. And so she's just spoken with Isaac, and then the, the, the text picks up here. So chapter 28, verse 1, it says, So Isaac summoned Jacob, blessed him, and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite girl. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your, fa- your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of Abraham so that you may possess the land where you live as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob, and Esau. Did you realize this is the first recorded conversation that Isaac has with Jacob, knowing that he was talking to Jacob? And he includes blessing. He gives instruction and blessing in this conversation. And the first instruction is, do not you love it when parents, we, we focus on the do nots, right, sometimes. But it's necessary, right? Do not touch the hot stove. It's for your good. And, and so here, do not marry a Canaanite girl. They're going to make your mother not want to live. He doesn't say that. Kind of implies it. Maybe his reasons are more spiritual, just as his own father Abraham uh, did not want Isaac to marry a Canaanite girl but sent him to his father's family, to his father's household in the same region that he is now sending Jacob to. So he says, go at once to this place, Padan Aram, uh, which is a region of which his family lives in, to the house of Bethuel, so literally his grandpa, his grandpa's house, to his uncle Laban, and he is to look for marrying one of Laban's daughters, one of his cousins. All right, now we've talked about some of this in the book of Genesis already. This is back before some of the human DNA had some of its issues. This was a way, ultimately, of this family saying, we, we want to preserve our way of walking with God. We don't want to venture out into people that have other gods and worship other gods. And so, Jacob, I want you to survive. I want you to go to your family to find a wife. Now, he, he gives the instruction but then he gives blessing. And now, for the first time, Isaac knowingly blesses Jacob, even though he knew what Jacob had done in stealing the blessing. I find that really interesting because this is not far removed. I mean, remember, this is probably days, maybe a week or two from when he uh, cheated his brother or, or deceived his, his dad to, to steal this blessing. And now Jacob is intentionally, I'm sorry, Isaac is, there's, boy, the names are tough, guys. Anyway, Isaac, the dad, is so ready and willing, and he blesses Jacob even as he goes. And he responds, he says, may God Almighty bless you and make you faithful. So he recognizes that blessing would come from God, the Father. And he announces a title that God gave himself when he spoke to Abraham just a while back. Of course, it was before Isaac was born, so it was probably more than 100 years before that God introduced himself this way as God Almighty, uh, the Hebrew El Shaddai, El Shaddai, God Almighty. In Genesis 17 is where we see God introducing himself that way to Abraham, and it was in the same passage that God called Abraham to walk with him in kind of a further way, and then also gave the sign of circumcision as part of that agreement as to understand this is the sign of what has been done in our relationship. And so this God that had been Abraham's God had become Isaac's God, and now Isaac is passing it along to Jacob that this needs to be your God too. And indeed, may he be the one to bless you and make you prosperous and fruitful and to do the things that I have spoken in blessing regarding you. And he adds, may you become an assembly of peoples, it's kind of an interesting phrasing. I don't, we don't see it very often in the New Test, or Old Testament, even regarding the people of Israel, an assembly of peoples. It's usually one or the other. They're assembly, they're an assembly, or they're peoples. But here, an assembly of peoples. And 
I think God is recognizing through Isaac as he speaks to Jacob that, that he is going to be the father of multiple tribes that are part of a larger family that is going to be this people that God uses to bring out the gospel, to bring out the Savior Jesus, an assembly of peoples. And he says, may God give you your offspring, you and your offspring, the blessing of Abraham. So Isaac is trying to pass down this, this relationship that God had with Abraham, that God had with him, and now he's giving it to his son and saying, it's yours, take it and run with it. May God do this and continue his promise to us through you. So he expresses that desire, that wish, and, and it brings us to our first of three points this morning. They're, they're points to just kind of break up the the text of what are the three big things we see happening here. And the first is this, his parents express God's call for Jacob. And it's somewhat instructive for us. It's, it's significant here because as Isaac speaks, he is essentially prophesying of what God had already promised. And, and it's a prophecy, it's a spoken blessing of the transferring of God's promise to Abraham that transferred to Isaac and now to Jacob as this family line continues on. And you know, and now we have the same kind of desire, don't we, as Christian parents? If you're, if you're a believer, if you're someone who loves Christ and you have kids or want to have kids, your hope is that one day they too will trust Christ and walk with Him by faith. It's our desire. And so we also should speak words of blessing and hope to our children and, and things that express that desire. May you know God. May you walk with Christ and live for him no matter what comes in life. Just as Isaac does for Jacob here. But it's not just something that's good that we should do. It's a responsibility. It's a responsibility to speak words of blessing to our children. It's our responsibility to express God's call on their lives to walk with him. You know, God has called your children to walk with God. He has invited them to walk with Him. And so it's also our responsibility to guide our children to good choices. And yes, as I've said before, that includes spouses. So, just like Abraham did for him, Isaac is doing for his son, directing him to find a wife from an appropriate place. Now we move to verse 6. Look at this next section with me. Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to get a wife there. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob, do not marry a Canaanite girl. So it's telling us from Esau's perspective what he heard. And then chapter, se- or chapter 28 still, but verse 7, it says, and Jacob listened to his father and mother and went to Padan Aram. So Esau observes, daddy told Jacob don't marry a Canaanite girl. In fact, go to our family in Padan Aram. And he witnesses and observes Jacob obeys. Jacob does what he's asked. And they see, Esau sees Jacob has received blessing from his dad and blessing from God. At least it seems that he will be blessed by God. So Esau, verse 8, realized that his father disapproved of the Canaanite women Remember, he is married to two Canaanite women. So Esau went to Ishmael and married. In addition to his other wives, Mehalath, daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, she was the sister of Nebaioth. So we see Esau noticing Jacob's blessing, his approval with his parents, the support that he has with his parents, and he recognizes, he realizes Dad doesn't like these girls that I've married. I don't know if Isaac ever expressed that. We see Rebecca expressed that to Isaac. But Esau realizes it here in this moment. And maybe in realizing his own poor choices, that that these poor choices might be part of the reason for his loss, for his lack of acceptance, and maybe for his lack of receiving a blessing And so I think Esau is beginning to figure out, I haven't been making good choices. So what does he do? He makes another bad choice. You have any kids like that? Are you like that? 
I think we are like that. So he goes to Ishmael. See, again, he perceived dad wanted Jacob to go marry someone from our family, and that pleases him. And maybe I would receive the blessing and acceptance that I long for if I, too, would marry someone from our family. So he goes to granddad's brother's household and marries his some kind of cousin, okay? Uh, But he marries another outcast son. Ishmael was an outcast of the family, and there really was a sharp division when Abraham sent them on their way. But yet God still promised to bless Ishmael. So maybe, maybe this would be the solution, I think Esau thought. I think that's what the text is, is showing us. I always thought it was he just, did, he just married another Canaanite like to, to uh, you know, further irritate his parents. But when you look at, no, 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 he married a family member. And I think it's because he was seeking approval. He was seeking acceptance, just like he seemed to believe Jacob had. But here's the problem. Esau, just like he had for so many years already, he was attempting to gain what he wanted his own way. See, he obtains a wife, not from a distant family, perhaps, uh, but a new, or, or uh, he attempted to get the approval of parents by marrying another family member. But what did he not do? He didn't consult with his parents first, did he? He just did it. He acted impulsively. It is again this picture of a rejected son, and and ultimately seals his status as the outcast son of this family by marrying into the family of another rejected outcast son. And the two outcast sons' families form an ancestral bond that we get an entire chapter dedicated to in a couple of weeks, well, a couple months probably. I think it's 37, is that right? Uh, Anyway, I see that, and I look at us as humans today, How many people, ourselves included, try to gain God's favor doing it our own way? It's it's human. It's more tangible. God declares salvation, forgiveness in him. In fact, he says, I declare righteous, my people, by just grace because I chose and I love and that's my character And so you get that because he's merciful, and you receive that by faith. No works. But you know what we do? I just, I don't know. I think I need need to know that God approves of me, so I'm going to earn that salvation. I'm going to earn that forgiveness by doing this and that and the other and going to church and being a part of this and doing all these things and making, volunteering at all these things. And then God will accept me. But you see, as much as we take that, like I say that out loud humanly, and I go, well, it doesn't seem that bad if we try to do that. Like that comes from a heart that wants to honor God, right? But no, do we not realize that that's actually dishonoring to God to go, no, your way's not going to work for me. Let me do it my way. And how about you accept me doing it my way? Right? We, we dishonor God by not simply accepting his way. Simple truth. Esau is a picture of trying to gain what we want our own way. And it doesn't ultimately get what he longed for. But this, this account is not over. We've got to continue in verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. By the way, Haran is just a town within the region of Padan Aram. So he is headed where he is instructed. Beersheba is kind of in the south part of Canaan, south part of modern-day Israel. And it says, verse 11, he reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. And that's always a fun one. 
it's not really clear where he put the stone. Some, some translations, um, some interpreters go, I think this means he used a stone as a pillow, and that's certainly possible. Uh, it's also possible he just arranged stones or, around his head uh, for whatever reason, for protection, safety, or block the wind or whatever. Either way, this is not, I mean, he's sleeping on the ground. And, and if a rock is your pillow, you're, you're a wanderer. And, and it's fascinating to think about Jacob in this moment. He had, he had kind of bought, deceitfully isn't the right word because he was upfront about what he was accomplishing, trying to accomplish when he took his brother's birthright at a highly discounted price of a bowl of stew. And, and then he is deceitful and he steals his brother's blessing, the firstborn blessing that his dad was going to give. And yet he has now abandoned all of that because he's not received, he doesn't have the inheritance of Isaac. He's now wandering with nothing. And he lays his head. He doesn't even have a tent of his own, so he just lays his head down and maybe a rock as a pillow. And, and we find what happens next in verse 12. And he dreamed. Somehow he slept with a rock as his pillow and he dreamed. And it says this is what he saw. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky. And God's angels were going up and down on it. Now, just real briefly, just a side note, some translations will go ladder here. And, and the text, the Hebrew is kind of ambiguous. It could mean ladder, could mean stairway, but just the picture of angels going up and down. If you have a ladder, it's kind of, I don't know, they'd be climbing over top of each other as one's going down, one's going up. So I picture stairway here, okay? And, and this connection between heaven and earth is made in his dream. And these angels, God's angels, God's messengers are going up and down on it. And then verse 13, the Lord was standing there beside him. The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, is Yahweh. It is a self-existent, eternal God, the one who made the covenant relationship with his granddad, Abraham, and his dad, Isaac. And he is standing there, the Lord is standing there beside him, saying, I am the Lord. Can you imagine in a dream having God standing there in, in some level of glory and saying, I am the Lord? Oh, okay. Wow. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. That same one. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. Hmm. Sounds familiar. 14, God continues in this dream speaking to Jacob. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. These are words spoken by God. And these are words that are very familiar because God's call to Abraham was very similar. And again, it's a continued promise down the generations. And he had a similar promise that he spoke to Isaac, the same one. And now he makes it to Jacob. In fact, the only really unique piece of that is where he says, you'll spread out towards the west, the east, the north, and the south. And, and so what he's saying there, he's kind of, where he is at is basically central Canaan. And he's saying, look, this is, all of this is going to be yours, both directions, north, south, east, west, all yours. But I don't even know. It doesn't stipulate only Canaan. And look at history. God's chosen people, the Israelites, have spread out all over the world and yet have come back to the land of Israel only in recent history to be a nation yet again. Now, where he's at is probably about a two- to three-day journey from where he started in Beersheba. He's still a long ways from Haran. Haran is about a 500-mile journey from Beersheba to Haran. It's a long journey for on foot. And, and it's interesting, this is uh, the place that he's headed. It mentions the name Haran as the town where he's headed. And that's the town that Abraham left when God called him. So Abraham left Haran, and now Jacob, full circle, is going back to Haran. But he's not supposed to stay there. And as he gets these few days into his journey and he's still a long ways from Haran he lays his head down at night on a pillow and he has this dream and he encounters 
the God of the universe. The God who is personal, who invited Abraham into this covenant relationship with him, and then his son Isaac and his son Jacob, and as God knew that it would go down the generations, Jacob dreamed and saw the Lord. God revealed who he is. He is the Lord, the self-existent eternal God. He is the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, and he says what he's going to do. He says, I'm going to give your off- you and your offspring the land. You get a land inheritance, and they're going to spread out all over the earth, and all people on the earth will be blessed through you. And he also describes their relationship, what it's going to be like. It's personal. It's not just, hey, I want to give you good things, but I am with you. How, I mean, let's, if you just pause, you don't have to answer this out loud, but can you just pause and go, how much do we long in our soul, to hear from God Almighty, I am with you. Not, I am against you and ready to strike you, which I think we feel a lot of times because of our sin, and we want to hide from Him. No, 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 this is, I am with you. What good has Jacob done to deserve this kind of treatment? Nothing other than God pouring His grace and mercy on Jacob. And and He says, I'll be with you and I'll watch over you wherever you go. Can you imagine how comforting that is for Jacob, who is a refugee who has fled for his life, doesn't have much to his name, and he is headed towards his uh, uncle's house or his grandpa's house, and he he here has God saying, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to watch over you wherever you go. So there's, there's nothing for you to fear. Trust me, walk with me is the idea. Oh, and finally, there's one other thing God wants to do for you. He says who he is, what he's going to do in the relationship, and oh, by the way, bonus, I will bring you back to this land. This specific land, this earth that you're standing on now, sleeping on now, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And by the way, when he says uh, English kind of makes it sound like that God might leave after he's fulfilled the promise, that, that's not what it means. But he's going to stay with him and he's going to see it through to completion and will be with him the entire way. He's not leaving. How many, so deep in our souls, we have that longing to hear God say, I am with you. You are mine. Oh, and by the way, that's never changing. I'm with you. And we'll never leave you. What an incredible promise for Jacob. What an incredible promise for us. God gave Jacob a glimpse into his own future. And the future is going to hold some really good things. It also holds some painful things for him too. How many of us would love that though? For God to open up the window into the future for our lives and for Him to just show us what is to come. Anyone ever have that like, God, if you would just show me, just, just let, what's the path? What's it going to be like? And you know, I think what we're really looking for is, God, show me how good my future can be or will be. Please? Because, you know, if He opens the door to our future and it's suffering and death, we kind of go, eh, maybe it's better not to know. But Jacob gets a glimpse into his future that God has spoken it. And you know, God has revealed his will to us. As I've said before, this is his word. He he gave us his word and he revealed, most importantly, salvation, forgiveness of sins, relationship with God in these pages. So he's declared it. He has made that known to us and I mean, to think God declared salvation through Christ, that we receive it by faith in Him, and that we'll be sealed with His Holy Spirit as a down payment of the fullness of that promise, which is still to come an eternity of fellowship with God. Woo! So, as I've heard before, God said it. If you've believed it, you and I have a similar hope as Jacob for a wonderful future. We may not really taste of wonderful till we're in heaven but I think we taste of wonderful now because we get to know the God of the universe. So point number two this morning, God's call is a declaration of what will be. 
I love that. From God's perspective, his plan for Jacob is not just a wishful thinking thought. It is a declaration. And when God declares something, it's as good as done. He conveyed it here in a dream. God has spoken to us by his word. And not to say that he won't speak through a dream. But he speaks through his word. And everything we have, that he, we think he's spoken to us in a dream or a revelation of some kind needs to be submitted to what his word says. But he has made his will so very clear in his word. We should, let's, let's prioritize embracing and obeying God's word. Believing it, doing it. All these, you imagine all the possibilities. What if Jacob says no? What if, what if Jacob stumbles and falls in a pit and dies before he can have a child? See, God is powerful enough to bring about what he declares. However that is, he can do it, and he will. Because here's the other side of that. If God is unable to bring about what he says, then God is weak and limited like us. But he's not. He's God. So Jacob has this amazing dream in which God spoke to him. So how does he respond? Well, verse 16 is going to tell us look there. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. We see different reactions, but they're all similar when people encounter God. Moses at the burning bush as he approaches, take your sandals off. Because the ground in which you're standing is holy. And not that the earth, you know, the Bible describes the earth as God's footstool. Right? It, it is, God's presence is, is everywhere on this planet. So technically, it could be anywhere that we are. And yet, in this place, this recognition of the presence of God brought terror and fear and excitement and wonder and just absolutely, whoa. Have you ever been that close? Have you ever encountered God? It, maybe it's something you read in His Word and you're like, whoa. Like, I... Whoa. I was talking to a, a group, a prayer coaching group that I'm, I'm a part of for a few weeks, and, and the guy leading the group was describing how his grandma, I think it was, uh, you know, hold, held God's word in such high regard, you know, she taught that you never put anything on the Bible. And I kind of grew up in that, that realm too, and I, I'm not saying that if, if we, I think it's much more of a heart issue, right? If you put another book on top of the Bible, it's just, a, it's just pages on pages. It, it doesn't mean that you're dishonoring God's word. But the idea of recognizing that this is something so incredible and so valuable to us, God's revelation to us, that it would cause you to think, I better not set down my phone on top of my Bible. I better not put a, a man-written book on top of my Bible because of the recognition of the holiness of God. Again, don't take that too literally. It's the concept, it's the heart attitude of when we have encountered God, we've encountered holiness. We don't deserve to be there. And it's incredible and it's terrifying and it's awe-inducing. And that's how he's feeling. That's how Jacob's feeling about it. This place was holy and it was special because God was present. So he continues there in verse 18, early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named the place Bethel, though previously the city was named Luz. I don't know why I made fun of that word, Luz. Can you guys say Luz without being like, oh, I don't know what that, 
early in the morning. So he, he's had this dream, and I, I mean, waking up in the morning and going, okay, what do I do with this thing? And the first thing he does is, oh, my pillow or this stone, like this is a special place, so I'm going to anoint it with oil and, and mark this place as a permanent reminder to me that God met with me in this place. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. How many of us have a Bible marked or a, a memento marking the moment that we gave our lives to Christ, that we put our faith in Him? Because that's a momentous moment. Or maybe when you were baptized, you got a little Bible or something with your name in it or something that you mark a special work of God in your life. Jacob is doing just that. And this place Bethel, the word Bethel means house of God. And this place Bethel is significant in the lives of the Israelites throughout history who are to come, his offspring. And we see that it also had significance prior to Jacob. Actually, Abraham was there as well. It tells us in Genesis 12, 8, that from there he, Abraham, moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent. Now it calls it Bethel here. It doesn't mean it was called Bethel then. It just means that the author of Genesis, when he wrote it, is referring to a place that the Israelites would recognize when they saw and read the book. Okay? Y'all track with that? Okay, well, if you didn't, we'll talk about it afterwards. I got to keep going. Okay. But he pitched his tent there and Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and he built Abraham built an altar to the Lord there, and he called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham, this was like his first worship experience with God in this same region, at least, the same area. Kind of cool that God would bring this dream and have this conversation with Jacob at the same place. So he's had this spiritual experience, and he's heard the voice of God declare what is going to be. So how does Jacob respond? Verse 20, then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and then if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give to you a tenth of all that you give me. So his response, make a vow to the Lord. I'm I'm going to make you my God, is what he summarizes. You know, Jacob is the first of the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the first to make a vow with God, like he is the one that voices the vow. God had made covenant with Abraham and Isaac, and now he's making a covenant. He's just communicating it, that it's there for you, Jacob. And Jacob responds with a vow. Is it necessary? I think it's simply Jacob's way of responding to God's merciful call. So here's what I see in Jacob. It's point number three this morning. Jacob understood that he must choose to surrender to God. God spoke. God declared. He must bow his knee. So, And some of us, by the way, require more assurance than others. When we, when we encounter God, right? We need that. We need a little more evidence. We just need a little more. God, show yourself, show yourself to be good. And, and so what does Jacob do? He repeats all the things that God said he would do for him and says, if you do those things, yeah, you'd be my God. So he wants to watch God watch over him. That's one of the things he said. He'd watch over him. God, if you watch over me, And the idea of that is like a shepherd watching over his sheep, protecting them from harm, making sure they have what they need, sustenance, water, still water to drink, and grass to eat. Or like a night guard keeping watch over the city, warning of dangers to come. That God would be one who would watch over him, that he would provide him with food to eat and clothing to wear, that he would also return safely to his father's family. He didn't put a timeline on that either, notice. But every condition he asked for, God had already promised. And I think this day, the Lord became his God. Here's why. He says, then the Lord will be my God. And I think in English we read will be and we think future tense. 
But in Hebrew, it's not future tense. It's called perfect in Hebrew, and it's difficult to convey in English because we don't have a perfect equivalent. But what it is is that the action of the verb, as a, it's a whole. It is complete, and it has no bearing on time. So he's saying, God, you have promised to be with me, to watch over me, to go where I go, to lead me, to bring me back safely to my father's family. And so he's going, that must be true. And because that's true, you're my God. And he later gets to see it fulfilled, of course. But that action is entire and complete, even in this moment, even for Jacob, is the way he declares it back to God. So he vows himself, he surrenders to God Almighty to be his God. Remember last week when he was stealing the blessing from Esau and he answered his dad Isaac and he said, you know, the, Isaac had asked, how did you get the game so quickly? And he said, because the Lord, your God, blessed me. And now he's saying, the Lord will be my God. He's done these things. He has promised this to me. It must be true. He will fulfill it. He is my God. If you've never had a moment in your life that you have declared, He is my God. And you're not in a personal relationship with Him. You're not in a personal saving relationship with Christ. And you need to have that moment yourself that you declare, Jesus, you're God. You have me. And then he sets up the stone as a marker. He anoints it with oil. It's a, it's a marker. It's a reminder for worship of the one who made the promise. That that is going to be an ongoing thing. Why else would you set up a marker? If you didn't want to remember it, you don't set up a marker. So he is there. He's going to be worshiping God for the rest of his life. And Jacob vows that the Lord will be his God. From now to the end. It's the whole complete picture, regardless of time. And so trust expressed now becomes a commitment of thankful giving. Did you see what he said at the very end there? It kind of goes really unnoticed. And I will give you a tenth of all that you give me. It's an appropriate response. Jacob recognizes that trusting God with his financial well-being is necessary, even though his financial situation at the moment is basically, I just need to survive. But giving a tenth demonstrates gratefulness for God's provision, whatever that provision is. As I say, God, you're the provider. You're the one that gave it all. So here, let me trust you. Let me worship you in, in giving back to you what came from you in the first place that I'm not even able to produce for myself if it wasn't for you. It calls back and reminds us of Abraham giving a tenth to a priest named Melchizedek. And so Jacob also plans to give a tenth to the Lord and by the way, this promise and Abraham's giving of a tenth all have occurred before it was law for the Israelites to give a tenth. They gave from their heart. It's got to be at least a tenth in their mind, it seems. And can we just finish with this idea? God's record is perfect. That means he has a 0% failure rate when he declares something. Soak that in a little bit. Eventually, we see Jacob's confession that God did indeed remain with him and provided for him. In Genesis 35, verse 3, it says, We must get up to Bethel. Jacob is the one speaking, of course. He says, I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in my day of distress. And right now in this moment where he is running from his brother Esau is his day of distress. And he continues on to a more distressing season but he finishes, he has been with me everywhere I've gone. I'm not saying hasten the day of your death, but can you imagine the day of our death and we open our eyes in glory and we look back at the life that was ours and we can declare the same thing, he's been with me everywhere I've gone. Zero percent failure with God. 
100% record. Now, I'm going to say a baseball reference that only three or four of you understand in here, but you know, even the best baseball players, their batting average is like three something. That means that they struck out, grounded out, flew out seven times out of every 10 at bats. And those guys are, we're like, whoa, those are amazing baseball players. God's a thousand. He's batting a thousand. Okay, for the two of you that got that, thank you for enjoying that, and let's <laughs> keep on. All right. Uh, you guys should get to know baseball better. It's a great game, but at the end of it all, here, here the Lord is writing His redemption story. He has been writing it all along. Choosing this family was part of bringing about a people that He was choosing, that He had chosen that he was yet to even reveal his choosing to set them apart as a special possession, a kingdom of priests and a people holy unto their God, which is not only the Israelites, but it is all those who put their faith in Christ. He's writing that redemption story. This is a small piece of it that we are allowed a glimpse into, and he uses his people, and he conveys the picture of salvation by faith right here with Jacob who has now to believe God before he fulfills the promise, which begins a life journey of walking by faith in God. And Jacob then saw that God became his Lord, his God. And we too have to make God our God, Jesus our God. So today, 2024, did you know that this same God desires for you to know him. And his call is an invitation to follow him by trusting Jesus. When you choose to surrender to him, that is to put your faith in Jesus for salvation, for carrying you through this life, that invitation becomes a declaration of God that you are saved. And what do we say about God's declaration? What's his failure rate again? Zero. He won't fail. God who doesn't fail will see you through this life into eternity with him. So let's not be like Esau who tried to get his approval his own way. Let us get God's approval simply by receiving the grace that he's given. Because his approval is not something we can earn. And many of you in congregation today, in the hearing of my voice, have already surrendered to Jesus. You've set up the marker. You've got the Bible with the reminder. You've been baptized. You've been a part of church for years and years. But can I just encourage you and remember the Jesus that we serve is the same Abraham God and Isaac's God and Jacob's God. And can I remind us that he offered us rest? I love what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, saying, come to me all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You no longer have to strive for approval on your own. You no longer have to do it yourself because it was never going to be good enough. But trust me. And he goes, take my yoke upon you. By the way, yoke is a, that, that wooden thing that bound two oxen together to plow the field to keep them going the same direction. It's more of a sign of slavery. But Jesus is saying, come be my family, come into my kingdom, bow your knee to me, total surrender to me, and you're going to find my yoke is actually light and my burden is easy. That, well, let me read it. Uh, because I'm lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Jesus who calls us to walk with him. And there's another passage, we read it in Sunday school in our class, and I want you to, I just want you to remember Hebrews chapter 4 says, that Jesus is our great high priest, that stairway between God and heaven, there was a necessary connection that needed to be made, and Jesus has become that connection for us. He is the mediator between God and man. He is the perfect high priest who suffered like us, experienced human life, uh, and it says we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He's been human. He knows our weakness. What a God that would give up the pleasures and the glory and the power of full godness and and empty himself of that to become human so that he would die for us and be 
made a way of salvation, not a way, the way of salvation. He was tempted in every way, back to Hebrews 4, verse 15, he was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. And so the cry, the call to those of us who believe in Christ, and even those that have yet to believe in Christ is this, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness because of the high priest Jesus. So approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I don't know why our human broken sinfulness looks at God and we're terrified and we don't want to go near him, but he has nothing but mercy when we come to him in Christ. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? I mean, brother and sister, what are you waiting for? I think we sometimes drift away from walking with the Spirit and we try to fulfill in the flesh what He started in the Spirit. Let's come back to the Spirit. Enter His presence with boldness. Find mercy and grace in our time of need. And if you have never put your trust in Christ, what are you waiting for? There is a God who knows you and wants you to know Him, who will be with you forever. And there's, there's nothing you have to do. You simply believe him. Trust him. And I'm going to say, if you do that, make, make that decision now. I want you to come tell me. Come tell somebody and begin the journey of walking by faith in God. Experience the joy of that for the rest of your life. And into eternity where it's unmasked joy. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of your mercy and the amazing nature of your unfailing love. We cannot, we cannot lose if we surrender to you. What a gracious and good God you are. God, I pray that you would draw our hearts to you even now, even more. We would be mesmerized by you, by your gracious nature, by your by the fact we can't even we can't even fathom the depth of your mercy and grace. And that is a freedom for us, Lord, not to continue in the things that please us that are so temporary and weak, but freedom to know you and pursue you for life unhindered by the shackles of sin's nature. You are glorious. And I pray you would move us in obedience to you in this moment, whatever that looks like. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.